So are you ready for the word? I am ready for the word. I believe God has a message for our church family, for our friends who are listening. So let's just start with a word of prayer, all right? Let's just posture our hearts before God. Look, no matter where you are, if you're at home, you still cooking breakfast, you doing this, just take a moment. Let's just get into the presence of God, all right? So Lord, we thank you. God, we come before you, thanking you for another Sunday. God, thank you for life, health, and strength. God, we want to thank you for our online community. Thank you for allowing us to worship virtually. So, God, we pray that you would bless this time in the word. Bless this time, Lord, that you would uh, open our ears and our hearts and our minds to what you would have to say to us as a collective body. God, we thank you that your word would accomplish everything that it's gone out to do. And we want to pr- give you all the honor and the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. And thank God. I'm so glad to be here with y'all again. So, as I said, we are in April. Can you believe it is April 2021 already? But this month, we are working on a theme of reclaiming. This whole year, we're working on reclaiming and restoring and reimagining. But right now, we're really uh, dealing with reclaiming the resurrection, right? Reclaiming resurrection. Yes, I know last Sunday was Easter. Yes, you know, Easter's the big, they say it's the Super Bowl of our Christian faith. But, you know, we want to take back the resurrection. We want to take back Easter in that we don't want to just relegate the resurrection to one Sunday. We don't want to just have one Sunday a year that we talk about the resurrection and just put a label of Easter on it and wear pastels and hand out Easter eggs. No, we are reclaiming the resurrection. And instead, we want to investigate how does the resurrection play out in our everyday lives? All right, y'all with us? Y'all with me? Okay, so I want you to think about it like this. Easter is like the wedding. You ever, you know weddings. Easter is the wedding. It's the big pageantry. It's the clothes. It's the things. It's all. But the resurrection is the marriage, right? The resurrection is where you walk it out every day. Resurrection is a lifestyle. Can somebody say that? Resurrection is a lifestyle. It's not just the big day. It's an everyday occurrence. So this is what we're talking about today. Uh, my, my text today is coming from Acts 4.33. And I really love this verse and I, I really thank God because uh, just last month we had a virtual leaders meeting. And this is the verse that we shared about this month. And it just so happens to be our lectionary passage today. So I know that God has a word for us because these things are all lining up. All right. So uh, Acts 4.33. It says, and with great power, the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus and great grace was upon them all. May God bless God's holy word as we dive into it today. The title that we're going to work from today, our title is Ask Me How I Know. All right. Can you put that in the chat? Ask me how I know. Can you say that again with me? Ask me how I know. This is our title today. And before we dive right into it, I just want to take a a quick little side note. I just want to see how the saints do. Saints, do y'all like to go to Target? Because I might have a problem. Are y'all like me? Do you like to go to Target? Target... Target is like a, a, a day out for me. It's, an, it's a fun day. It's a, it's a thing that I enjoy getting out of the house to do. I like to go to Target. Uh, can, is anybody else out there with me? I hope, I wish y'all were with me because I could get some feedback. But I'm going I'm to think that some of the saints are like me. But have you ever gone to Target and you made the mistake of wearing red that day? Or you happen to have on khakis? Have you ever did this before? Have you ever wore red when you went to Target? And what happens when you wear red at Target? You get a bunch of unsolicited people walking up to you, asking you for things like, hey, do you know where toasters are? Hey, excuse me, can you point me to diapers? And if you're wearing red that day, you're like, hey, I don't work here. I'm sorry, I can't even help you, right? Has, it, has that happened to anybody? That I'm, I really try not to wear red or khakis to Target because 
I don't want people asking me things, right? Especially if I don't work there. Don't ask me where candles are. I don't know. But conversely, have you ever uh, been in Target and you, you need to know where something is and you find someone who legitimately works there, they're wearing red, they have a name tag, and you ask them where things are and they, they can't tell you. Like, hey, excuse me, I'm looking for uh, gym equipment. Can you point me? And they're like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's somewhere between Al 1 and Al 9. Like, what, sir? Like, excuse me? Like, can you give me? OK, you can't help me. I'm asking you for something, and you can't help me. That is so frustrating, right? That's such a bad feeling. But I believe that this is how people feel about Christians. I believe that we are people who claim to have faith. We have people who claim to know Jesus. We got all the signs, like we have our spiritual red shirt on, and people ask us things, and we don't know. I'm, I'm thinking particularly about this when it comes to the resurrection. People want to know, was this just a story? Is this a nice little story in the Bible? How do you really know that Jesus is alive? How do, what, what, what tangible evidence do you have? How do you know? How do you know? And I think it behooves us as Christians who are wearing our spiritual red shirts to be, be able to give an answer to people in this day and age. Amen? Amen. So I want to look at the story. It's a story in Acts 4, and it's about a group of the early believers who just Began starting off this Christian faith. They're, they're starting off the church, and they are a good example of how to live a lifestyle of the resurrection. It's a resurrected lifestyle. So this is where we find. We, we just read Acts 4.33, but I want to give you some backstory because we just can't land in Acts 4.33. You got to know the story behind it. So if you got your Bibles, this will be a great reading this week to follow along uh, in your Bibles and read this for yourself. In Acts 3, we have the story of the lame man being healed uh, and by Peter and John as they're going to the, the temple. It's a great story. The man's begging. Peter heals him. The man's jumping and leaping and praising God and making a big deal. It's just such a great story, right? All of this drama happens because of this one healing. After the man gets healed, there are some haters. There were the, the Pharisees and the, the religious leaders, the people who worked in the temple. They, they became haters. And if you look at Acts 4, 1 through 3, I'm just giving you the context so you can understand why our verse is so amazing. Acts 4, 1 through 3 says, And as they were speaking to the people, the priest and the captain of the temple and the, and the Sadducees came to them, greatly annoyed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they arrested them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. Can you believe this? They got, our boys got arrested for preaching the gospel. Not only did they get arrested, they got arrested like on a Friday. If you are if you from the hood, you know you don't get arrested on Friday because you ain't coming out till when. Monday, right? You ain't going to even see a, a court until Monday, right? So our boys, they got arrested for telling people that Jesus is alive, all right? So uh, and, and in verse 18, if you're still following in, in Acts 4, verse 18 says, they had to eventually let him go, but they charged them not to speak in the name of Jesus. Like, hey, y'all can do whatever you want, but don't be out here talking about that Jesus guy, Right. This is this is what they were charged with. And then look at their reaction. You got to follow along and Acts 4, Acts 4, 23, Acts, Acts, Acts 4, 29 is hashtag church goals, because after they got out of prison, after they got let free, after they got let go, after they got sent home, their attitude was very peculiar to me. They weren't mad. They weren't like, God, we out here healing people and you just going to make us get arrested. No. Look at their reaction. Verse 29. And now, Lord, this is Peter praying. Look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness. 
and well, you stretch out your hand to heal and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of the Lord with boldness. Can you say hashtag church goals? Like after this, they was like, you know what we're going to do? We're going to be even more bold. God, give us more boldness. They told us to shut up. We're going to say it even louder. Come on with it. This is church goals. They're like, God, this is just a side note. God, do it through miracles, signs, and wonders. Let them know that you are alive because of these wonders that you performed through us. And give us boldness. And the place was shaken. And they were all filled. Somebody say all filled with the Holy Spirit. That's our church goals. We want everybody filled with the Holy Spirit. And every time we get together to when we get back in in person, and even when we're online, we want the place to be shaken. Can I get an amen? Y'all feeling this with me? I'm feeling this. All right. So all of that backstory leads us to our feature verse, which is Acts 4, 33. And with great power, the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus and great grace was upon them all. Now, this is very, this is, this is a very interesting verse to me because of all the things the first church could have been preaching about. They could have been preaching about a lot of things. They could have been like, hey, join our house churches. We're starting to meet up in small groups. They can like, hey, we have free food for widows. We help the widows and the home, like, come on down. They could have been like, hey, we featuring healing services. We just had a dude got... He got healed from being lamed. Come down for your healing. But no, this was not their original message. According to our, our, our feature verse today, they proclaimed the resurrection. They were giving testimony to the resurrection. They were giving testimony to the resurrection. Church, can we get back to that? This was their one message. They weren't talking about come down to do this or that or do we talking about this one thing we're going to talk. You want to know what our sermon is going to be on Sunday? The resurrection of Jesus, that Jesus is alive. I love that. It was as though they had on the red Target shirts and they were saying, hey, ask me how. Ask me how I know. And hey, you ever, you guys remember, I'm taking you back to elementary school. Remember when you were in fourth grade and you really knew an answer to a question and you were in school and your teacher was acting like they couldn't see you and you had your hand up? You know that feeling? Like, I have the answer. Oh, me, call me. This is, why they're, that, this is how the disciples felt. Ask me how. I love this because I would love for us to get back to this. They said they were, they were, giving testimony to the resurrection of Jesus. You, there are certain qualifications you have to have to be a witness. You have to be able to have seen or heard something. If you read back in Acts chapter 4, go ahead and read it. He said when they tried to shut him up, they say, we can't help but to talk about what we have seen and heard. That's your qualification to be a witness. So I want to propose to you, when we're signing up for this resurrection life, you really don't have much to say if you haven't seen or heard anything that the Lord has done in your life. You have to be a witness. They were witnesses. They personally saw and heard what Jesus had did. They personally saw and heard that Jesus had rose from the dead. And guess what? This was breaking news back then. And if you would read the first couple of chapters of Acts, Peter's giving it to him. He's like, hey, yeah, that dude y'all just crucified like 50 days ago, like, you know, like two months ago, that guy y'all crucified on the tree, he's alive. It was breaking news because everybody saw him die on the, on the tree. Everyone saw him die on the hill. And they're like, wait, what? He's, he's back? It's like, yes, back like he never left. That's what it was original back then. That's okay. So. This was breaking news back then. 2,000 years ago, people needed to know 
that Jesus was alive. But I would like to submit to you that even though this was thousands and thousands of years and this story has been told over and over again and the average person could probably tell you this story if you were to stop it on the street, people still want to know, is Jesus really alive? People still want to know, is this real? Is this just a story? Is this something y'all do every year just to dress up? Is this a way to just make hard boiled eggs? Do you just hand out candy every year? Do, is Jesus really alive? This is what people want to know. And somewhere, our message has gotten convoluted. I mean, do you agree with me? Sometimes we have turned Christianity into something else. Like we've made it about, about a bunch of rules or standards or dress code or who you can and cannot love or what you can and cannot do, what you can and cannot drink or do all these things. We've turned it into something else. We've turned it into branding and messaging and smoke and lights and getting people in and numbers and building funds. We've turned it into so many things. But what if we return to this original message? What if we at the Way Christian Center return to this original message and reclaim the resurrection and tell people, hey, ask me how I know. Ask me how I know Jesus is alive. What if this was our message? That we just don't tell people about the resurrection through words, but through our lives. Do you feel me? We're not just telling a story. We're demonstrating that Jesus really rose from the dead and that Jesus is alive and that the resurrection is real. What if we live this? And I know you might be listening to this and be like, okay, that sounds cool, but it really sounds really, um, it really sounds like it's, it's ethereal. Like, okay, what does that mean? Like, how do I show people that Jesus is alive. Like, how can I live this practically? How can I really make resurrection a lifestyle? Well, I have just have two things I want to leave with you, just two points. And the first way that we can really reclaim resurrection and turn it into a lifestyle is to take inventory of the things that have died in your life. I'm going to let you sit with that for a minute. Take an inventory of the things that have died in your life. See, us as believers, our lives should not be marked by deadness, by being just dead. Like things, that should not be an indicator of our lives. You know what I mean, like dead hope, dead joy, dead peace, like just dead, dead attitudes, just no, just, that should not be an indicator of our life in Christ. You know what I'm talking about? Like, just think about your spiritual life. Like, here are all the words for dead. Like, uneventful, uninteresting, uninspiring, dull, boring, flat, quiet, sleepy, slow, humdrum, tame, or lackluster. This should not be adjectives that describes the life of a believer. Like, yeah, really, let's take inventory in our life. What has died? What has died in you? What dream has died? Has forgiveness died? Has love died? What in your life needs to be resurrected? And I'm just talking to you personally, because a lot of times we start thinking about resurrection. We're like, ooh, I want God to resurrect this relationship. Or you know what? Bro might have moved on. Sis might have been like, no, let's not involve nobody else. What we want, what, what, what can God resurrect in your own life? Life. Take an inventory. What has died? What do you need to be for God to res resurrect? And so our second point is, our second point is for you to critique your Christian journey and ask yourself, do you have a personal resurrection story? It's so important to look back over your life. The time that you started following Christ, the time that you asked Jesus into your life, the time that you decided to make Jesus your Lord and Savior. Ever since that time, do you have a personal story, just like Miss Nancy, where she was uh, living one way and God raised her up into another life? 
Do you have a personal resurrection story? Because God is calling for us to embody the resurrection, to live it, for not to just to be a story that we, we recount once a year, but to really body this thing. Thank you, Beyonce. We're going to get me bodied on this resurrection. Amen. Our lives should say that Jesus is alive. And Jesus is alive. Ask me how I know. Ask me how I know that Jesus is alive. Because, get this, I was dead in sin, but now I'm alive. See, that's a testimony right there. A lot of us like, well, I don't have like a really dramatic testimony. Like I just kind of, like I got saved when I was young. Like, I don't, even if you don't have a dramatic story, this is our testimony of the resurrection, that we were once dead in sin, and now we are alive. I want to just go to really quickly Ephesians 2 and 1. I could barely make it through the reading of this scripture because it's so good. Ephesians 2 just makes me want to shout. Like, it's so good. It's too good. You ever say something like, it's way too good. It's, it's too good to be true. Ephesians 2, check it out. It says, and you, and you, somebody say you, and you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, and the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. Can anybody say, yes, that was me, it was me, I've been there, done that. But look at verse 4. But God, somebody say it with me, but God. But God, I could just shout right there, but God, being rich in mercy because of the great love which, which, with which he has loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive with Christ, by grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him, and seated us with him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. Oh, man, you, could, you should just sit in this verse all week. We were once dead. We were dead in sin. This is why this resurrection story is so great. This is why we just can't leave it to one day. This is why we got to embody this thing. This is why we have to live out the resurrection because we were once dead in sin and our trespasses. Okay, so you see we have a body, a soul, and a spirit. This is why this is so important. We have a body, a soul, and a spirit. Now, our body is our physical flesh. Our soul is our, our will, our emotions, our intellect, right? But our spirit, our spirit is something different. Our spirit is how we communicate with God our, because God is a spirit, right? This is how, so before we know Christ, we are dead spiritually. We have a dead spirit. Our spirit is not alive to God. Our spirit is dead to the things of God. That's why a lot of y'all would have, 10 years ago, you would never be watching a virtual service. At right now, at 10 a.m., no, you would never do that. If before you come to know God, you would never care about the things. You wouldn't even, you'd cut somebody smooth out, wouldn't think twice about it, fight, all, those, all the things, right? Our spirits were dead to God. But when we come to Jesus, our spirits are made alive. This is how we communicate with God. This is how we commune with God. This is how we pray with God. Our spirit is what uh, interacts with God. And once you accept Christ and once you come into Christ, your spirit is made alive. So this is why Paul was saying you were once dead. You were once dead in your sins, dead in your trespasses. 
But once we accept Jesus, our spirit is resurrected. We are made alive. Is anybody happy about that? Is anybody excited that your spirit has been made alive in Jesus Christ? We were once dead. This is all of our testimony. We are all in the same category. We were once dead, and now we are alive, and this is why we embody the resurrection. This is why this is so good. This is why we got to tell people. This is why the disciples was like, we got one story. We got one message. We preach in one sermon, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Because in Christ, Christ will raise you up from the dead. Jesus will raise you from dead places in your life. Amen. Amen. And also really quick, I got to throw in Romans 6, 11. Romans 6, 11 says, so you must consider yourselves dead to sin and, to, and alive to God in Christ Jesus. So this is our new position. Once we're, when we're living this resurrected life, we are dead to sin now and we're alive to God. That's a, that's a whole, that's a game changer right there because that means that there's some things that need to stay dead in your life. When God raised your spirit up with Jesus, some things need to stay dead. We, we resurrecting the wrong things. We resurrecting old habits, old booze, old things in the past. Those are the things that are supposed to stay dead. Now we are dead to sin and alive to Christ. You can't get a dead man to sin. I want you to try it. I want you to go to the funeral home and try to get one of your homies, anybody who have passed away, try to get them to go out with you one more time. You can't get a dead man to sin. This is how we are supposed to be in the spirit, alive to God, dead to sin. Alive, what do we mean? We want to be alive. We want to be alive in God. We want to be breathing, moving, vigorous. This is what our spiritual life should be, flourishing, dynamic, energetic, functioning, animated. It should be organic and lively, alert and active, energetic, vibrant, vivacious, buoyant, exuberant, zestful. This is what it means to be alive in Christ. This is what our spiritual life should look like. This is what our prayer life should look like. This is what our worship life should look like. We're not supposed to be dead in Christ. We are alive. And that doesn't necessarily mean your style. Everyone has different demeanors. You could be the most quiet person in the world, but your heart and your mind is alive to God. Amen. Hallelujah. This is what we're doing. So as I close, I really believe this is what God is calling for in this hour. God is calling for a group of people. God is calling for his churches. God is calling for people who love him to be revivalists in this hour. It's one of my favorite words, to be a revivalist. Can you say that with me? A revivalist. God is calling for a revivalist. And this is not the one who put a tent out and had revivals. That used to be what revivalists were. But in this modern day, I believe that God is raising up people who will bring life everywhere they go? Everywhere you go, you bring life. Everywhere you go, you're speaking life into someone. Everywhere you go, there is an atmosphere of life around you. I'm signing up for this. I want to be a revivalist in this hour. So when you walk into a room, people are not like, oh, here we go. Here comes Debbie Downer. Here comes negative Ned. Like, no. When you walk into a room, life. And life more abundant is given. You're speaking life. You are everywhere you go. Things are happening. This is what God is calling us to. People who will proclaim the resurrection and bring life wherever they go. Will you be this? Are you, are you, are you hearing the call? Are you feeling the stirring in your heart that God wants to use us as a church family to bring, be, be revivalists, to bring revival to our cities, to our churches, to our neighborhoods, our communities? Come on, this is what God is calling for in this hour. A people who will say, ask me how I know he lives. Come on, people who will say, ask me how I know. Ask me how I know, call on me. I know there's an old hymn, y'all wanna go there? I wish I was here, cause we could sing this together. A, whole, a old hymn says, I serve a risen savior. He's in the world today. I know that he is living Whatever men may say, I see his hand of mercy. I hear his voice of cheer. And just the time I need him, he's always near. What did it say? He lives. 
He lives. Christ Jesus lives today. What does he do? He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives. He lives salvation to impart. This is my part right here. You ask me how I know he lives. Ask me how I know. Ask me how I know he lives. Come on, tell somebody, say, ask me, ask me. Tell somebody sitting there, ask me how I know. Put it in the chat. Ask me how I know he lives. How? He lives within my heart. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God lives within my heart. Can you say that? Is that your testimony? Are you signing up to be a revivalist in this hour? Will you make a decree, God, I want to proclaim your resurrection, not just on Easter, but every day of my life. If I were to sum up this whole sermon in one sentence, it would be that we are to live lives that continually proclaim the resurrection of Jesus. People need to see that Jesus is alive through our lives. So I just have three questions to take away with you. You can talk, to, uh, talk about them in your small groups or at home or just ponder them in your own times of reflection. Number one, where do you need a personal resurrection? Where in your life? Where do you, where, can you sit down and think about this this week? God, these are the things I need you to bring back to life. I need more forgiveness. I need you to love, I need peace. I need your joy. I need to trust you more. God, these, my hope has died. My dream has died. I need a resurrection. I want my own story. Awesome. Also, number two, what needs to stay dead in your life? Come on, we need to identify that. Don't be resurrecting everything now. Some things need to stay dead. Come on, so have some time between you, your accountability people, your small groups. What needs to stay, stay dead? And lastly, How can your life continually proclaim that Jesus is alive? How can your life always tell people that, hey, Jesus is alive. This is no story. I could give you facts. I have a testimony. I've seen and heard. I know too much about God. You can't make me doubt him. I already know too much. All right? This is what, these are the things we're going to be thinking on this whole month. Perpetual resurrection because Jesus indeed is alive.